Hello, my friends. Apologies for the late start. That's entirely my fault because um, the YouTube live stream doesn't work through Safari, so I had to log in to Google Chrome. Apologies. Hands up. So I'm so glad to see so many people here. Thank you for coming and welcome. I'm Henriette. I'm the founder of Pro Am Strings and you may know me from the videos. <clears throat> Once every so often I do a live class and that is to encourage you to, um, uh, to connect with this channel and to enjoy your playing even more and to, answer, uh, to ask any violin related questions that you may have. So here we are today. This session is usually lasting for about uh, an hour. It depends on how many questions there are and on how long my answers are going to be. But uh, we finish at about three o'clock UK time. Uh, and I'm hoping that you enjoy it. It's all laid back. You, can, you don't need to worry about asking questions. There isn't a silly question at all. If something is uh, an issue for you, then I'd be happy to answer it. But before we get into the questions, let's just see how this works. And um, who am I to explain how the live stream works? Um, maybe you can go, uh, you can have a look through with me. So on the right hand side of your screen, you see a chat box. And you at the bottom where the line is, and the arrow, you can write your questions there. And as we go along, I shall try and read up on every question that gets asked and I will try and answer it in order of people asking the questions. Now, forgive me if I have a difficult question and I miss yours, then pre please just remind me because that's not because I have forgotten you. It's just that other things took over <laughs> momentarily. So you can write it in the chat box on the right hand side at the bottom and you can also add emojis to it if you like that and then you can see that little dollar sign and if you click on that you can um, buy me a super sticker or a super chat and that is either an animated image or you can highlight your message so it comes to the top of the screen so if that is what you want to do you do that in order to support the channel or to highlight your questions um, so you can click on that button or um, uh, the, the next button is creating a poll. I won't be doing a poll today, so we don't need to worry about that. So first of all, let's familiarize ourselves with that chat box. So I know that you guys, you can all, you feel happy to use the chat box. So someone's, or actually two people have already written where they're from. They are sort of um, uh, people who may have been to these live chats before. So I usually ask people, just write, in the chat box just to have a practice where you're from and today I would like to uh, add another question to that and that is how long have you been playing the violin so feel free to write in the chat box um, so I am in Norwich UK and um, <clears throat> hopefully that sets the scene and you can um, write your where you live there as well so hello Kim's YouTube channel from Mich Michigan, USA. Nice to see you here. And here you are. Enika is from Subotica, Serbia. Hello, nice to meet you as well. And you will find that in this, in these classes, there are usually regular viewers of my videos. So I know Kim, Kim's YouTube channel, and I know Enika as well. And we have already had a couple of conversations, haven't we? Um, and people have asked questions. By the way, whilst we're Kim's YouTube channel says um, smiley face, thank you. By the way, whilst we're waiting for people to write down where they're from, you can just behind me here see I've been recording videos this morning, so you have a little bit of a um, behind the scenes um, view there. Now then. Uh, let me get started. Linda, hello from Kent. Someone from the UK here as well. Welcome, Linda, and welcome, Kim, and welcome, Enika, and anybody else who might be here and remains incognito. So um, underneath videos, people sometimes write questions, 
and I collect all these questions so that I can address them in a live stream like this one today. Um, so let me start while you get your questions going. Let me get started by answering some questions that people have already put below any videos. And one question is, <clears throat> I don't know who it's from, but it may well be one of you guys. I don't know. Uh, I cannot reach the point of the bow. And that is a question that I get asked quite frequently. And there is a very, very simple solution to that question. And I'll show you what happens. <clears throat> now, in this live stream, I shall not actually be playing quite a lot because the sound quality, I'm looking into that still, and the sound quality is just not as good. But I can show you a lot of principles now when you play and you play like this and your bow goes like that it's very difficult to reach the point of the bow so that was the question I cannot reach the point of the bow and all you need to do if you want to reach the point of the bow is push your bow arm forwards so that your bow gets parallel to the bridge can you see that I was quite angled here this way, I can't actually move my arm further back, so that's why this person can't reach the point of the bow. If you go forward, so my, my forearm is moving towards the front of my body, then you can bow straight and you can reach the point of the bow. You see, so a, a very simple solution to a very common issue. So if that's you, please don't despair. What you want to do is go from here, Move your arm forward. <clears throat> right, here is the first question in the chat box. Thank you, Kim, for writing this question. In Suzuki Book 1, Minuet 2, notations on the first few notes are what I think is tenuto, but it seems like the Suzuki CD and my friend here want the notes to play like staccato. Yes, that is a very good question. And <laughs> that is a very valid question as well, because... Um, that happens quite a lot in arranged music. And Suzuki, Mr. Suzuki has arranged all the pieces so that they're suitable for, uh, well, this is book one, for beginner violins. So um, whilst you are a beginner, you want to play your notes with the bow on the string and you want to play tenuto. Uh, and that is very good basic starting point for learning to play the violin you you increase your tone quality and you set yourself up for success in later what well, later once you've progressed however if you have a minuet and I, I don't know who the composer is I'm just trying to read whether you've written that uh, but minuets are often written by baroque composers and there will will be a lot of staccato notes you see, so when you think of a musical rendition of this piece, you'd probably want to play the notes staccato. But from a pedagogical perspective, as a violin teacher, I would always encourage you, as Mr. Suzuki does, to play it tenuto. So that means sustained notes. Do not play staccato. And I would recommend if you're a beginner, I don't know, I'm not saying you're a beginner, I don't know what you are, um, then play legato rather than staccato and it's only after you are competent in playing legato that you would add staccato you see so that is where the mismatch comes from a little bit so yes in baroque music which minuets often are staccato but if you are learning to play the violin i would encourage you to play legato i hope that answers your question and somebody, 77 Social, hello from Texas, brand new to the violin. You're in the right place. Welcome. Lovely to hear from you here. <laughs> These notes make me crazy, by the way. Oh, it's Bach. Yes, there you go. That's Baroque <laughs> music. Um, Enika says, I practice every day, morning, evening with sound normally. So no, they just practice something silently. I try to find out what silently works best in practicing. Yes, what, how can you practice silently? Sometimes there is a need for that, isn't it? I would say whenever you can play out loud, that is always far preferable than playing too uh, soft. 
but there are different types of mutes that you can get because sometimes there is no going about it. When I was touring, uh, I, I used to play in hotel rooms and you don't make yourself very popular by playing the violin out loud in a hotel in the middle of the night. So there are mutes around and those are things that dampen the sound of the violin. Let me just get one or two different ones. Um, oh. Hang on. No. Well, I have just um, lent my other mute to a, a pupil of mine, and this is what's called a hotel sourdine, and it it clamps on the on the bridge like this. <clears throat> it's actually quite heavy, and you can push it on further or less far, and that mutes the sound quite considerably. So this would be my hotel mute. It's it's a heavy thing, like I said, and what it does is. The, the way a sound is produced on the violin is that when you bow, you create vibrations, you make the strings vibrate, and those vibrations go through the bridge and into that imaginary column of air that is inside the violin. Now, if you put a mute on your bridge, it stops the vibrations, it stops the, the bridge vibrating because it, it holds it. I mean, a simple clothes peg would also do this, do the same thing, and you could clip it on the side, for instance, here. And you'll hear, this is a nice experiment for you to do, you'll hear a completely different sound. So if you must practice silently, occasionally, then buy a couple. They're not very expensive. You can buy them off Amazon and so on. They cost a couple of pounds. Just to experiment with the different, um, different sounds uh, of the different mutes. I can remember for my final exam at my conservatoire, I played a Mio Sonata by Darius Mio. And um, I was experimenting. That piece has got a, a section in with a mute. It's described in the music, now mute your violin. And I can remember endless varying the different mutes. And I was just having clothes pegs on the side or on the top or on this side because you can mute lower frequencies or you can mute higher frequencies and and this way it's just a fun experiment to do right let me see i hope that's answered your question let me see what my next question is okay linda linda says any tips for improving the tone when you're playing in the third position it never sounds as nice and in the first position as in the first position that is a very good question linda as well and what's happening when you play in the third position? Perhaps if I explain why that is, then, then you can think of solutions. When I play in the first position, like, like here, um, the length of string that you've got vibrating is from here to there, isn't it? Now, if I play in the third position, and say I'm playing here, the length of string that is vibrating is just this bit here. And a shorter string just doesn't make as good a sound as a longer string. And you'll find that, therefore, your open strings will have the best sound because the string is the longest. Now, if I play in a very high position, say, I, say I'm playing here and my string is ultra short, and I bow in the normal position, say here on the E string, I bow roughly, it's not quite, but... Let's imagine I bow here. I bow roughly in the middle of that length of string that is vibrating here, is here, which gives you the same quality sound as when you play an open string and your bow is here. And we all know that that's ridiculous. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? So the higher you play on the positions in your violin, the shorter your string length is, the closer your bow should come proportionally to the bridge so and that you start to notice that already a little bit when you play in the third position that's the first moment really maybe when you start to notice it I'm, if I'm in the third position here that your string is getting shorter and therefore your bow needs to move towards the bridge try it out when you're practicing when you're next playing in the third position and let me know how that works for you. If you notice a difference in sound, it would be interesting. 
So, anybody else? <clears throat> what kind of exercising you recommend for one child violin and a group's child who would like to learn step by step something from that? They are just three, four to seven years old and and they would like. Okay. What sort of exercising do I recommend? I'm, I'm thinking about that now. Something from violin playing. <laughs> I used to teach three-year-olds a long time ago. And I don't now because I think three-year-olds should play out in the garden, if you really are, ask my honest opinion. Um, there are lots of three-year-olds and four-year-olds who start playing the violin, don't they? Um, and I also see, because they come to me sometimes as well, and I see some very, very good results. So don't get me wrong. Uh, I don't tend to teach that young children anymore, but they are. Um, and they tend to do very well with the Suzuki method. Uh, and But what I'd like to do is just let them play outside and start them when they're about six or seven and the reason why I'm recommending that, I usually say to people, if they come to me and have a little chat about violin playing for their youngsters, can they write their own name with joined up letters? So not um, J for Johnny and then a bit further along the, the page O for Johnny and so on, but really nicely joined up. And I think that is the right time for children to learn to play the violin. This is just one of many different opinions, don't get me wrong, but this is my personal opinion. Um, and the reason why I ask people to do that is that when I teach those children the violin, I'm asking them to use their fine motor skills. You can imagine if you ask a child to do that, um, that is fine motor movements. Um, Unfortunately, fine motor skills, especially in boys of three and four year olds, are just not developed. They cannot do it. And you can see that because they can't write. They haven't yet learned it. And they are playing with, say, wooden blocks when they play Lego bricks that are bigger first and then get smaller. And that is because their fine motor skills do not start to develop until age six and in some until age seven. So I find I find it a bit mean as a violin teacher if I ask young children to perform a skill that they and that I know they cannot yet physically perform. So that's why I'm no longer teaching those small children. So if you want to teach them something is big, big things like waving their arms, doing that, doing all sorts of bow exercises with big movements because they have got large motor skills and they can do that. I hope that answers your question and it is not too much of a personal opinion. <clears throat> I'm just reading an, um, some new comments. Dangerman says, thanks for the info and mute. I also travel a lot. Uh, um, that's, that is a very useful question, I think. The question is, would an electric violin be silent enough or is a mute a better option? And my honest answer is I have no idea because I don't own an electric violin. I've only once played on one, which was fun. <laughs> uh, but I can't compare it to a normal violin with a mute. So hands up. Sorry, I can't I can't tell you anything about that. Here is Tao Dai. Hello. Welcome to this channel and to this live stream. I've been following your course up to part 10. My problem right now is my ears are not working too well. I have no music prior to training. Okay. Okay. Now, um, is there anything particular that you want to know? Um, much of violin playing is based on good hearing, isn't it? Uh, and... And that is a difficult one if your hearing is not as good. Now, I, I know of people who are hard of hearing or have got an issue with their hearing, can still learn to play the violin, but I am by no means an expert on that. And I'm hoping that your hearing will improve. That is just a temporary thing um, because it, it will be very difficult, I guess, to 
um, to play the violin when your hearing is not optimal. So find a specialist on that to help you with that. And, and that I am not, I'm sorry to say. Um, could you suggest exercises for getting the speed of the right and left hand in sync? Finding one hand is often moving faster than the other. Don't seem to be making progress with practicing a piece. Yes, that is a very, very often asked question that left and right hands do not move together. Um, I'm just trying to think now because um, I have recorded a video on that. I'm trying to think which one it is. Mind you, you, Kim, you will have come across it most probably. Um, <coughs> I'm just trying to think. Uh, what you can do is play dotted rhythms. So when you play da 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 da, and then once you've done that, go da 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 da, and and that will get your synchronization closer together. So I call this long short da. Da, da. You can also play it on open strings, but you were particularly asking on on fingers. And short long da 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 short long short long or long short long. And when you practice, especially uh, scale passages or runs in your music, and you play them with rhythms, although they might be written as even notes. After practice, that should get better. You say it doesn't get better with uh, with practice. No, it won't if you keep on playing even notes because then you will accidentally play unevenly. But if you deliberately play unevenly, long, short or short, long, that will come and makes it makes the even playing, the even notes better as well. Hope that helps. Ah, Rihanna, welcome to this channel. I haven't heard or seen your name, but welcome. It's lovely to see you here. You're a beginner. Any tips on how to bow straight? And um, when you look back on the live stream, right at the beginning, we have uh, talked about this. And what happens when you're a beginner and you bow? And as I've said before, I shall be bowing now because the sound quality on live streams is just not not what I would want you to hear. Um, when you bow and your bowing goes like this, there is a moment when you can't go any further because your hand can't go further back, your, your upper arm can't go further back. And what you need to do in, in order to bow straight is push your bow arm forwards. So literally forwards, look, I'm, I'm ending up straight in front of my tummy here. That feels really weird because we always think violin playing goes sideways, doesn't it? But actually it goes forwards. So rather than this way, it goes forwards and back. So if you want to bow straight, you want to push your bow arm forwards like this until you're there. And literally my arm, look, can you see? My arm is straight in front of me here. So that is what you want to do. Come away from this and stretch your arm forwards. I hope that helps. <coughs> And hello, Wendy. Nice to see you as well here. Um, oh, let me see. I've just scrolled too far forwards. Linda, thank you. I'll give that a go. Tao Dai says, my son is five and a half and I've decided to get him started with the piano instead of the violin to train his ear and st finger strings first. It's a, good, it's a good idea. And ask your teacher about this but piano has got fine motor movements as well but I'm sure you'll find a good teacher for your son and he's five and a half so he's just past that three to four year old uh, barrier so that that is excellent tell him good luck with his piano practice um Aditya hello Aditya nice to see you here Kim, hi, Michigan, from New York. Hello, Wendy. <laughs> uh, you two know each other, don't you? I'm putting the violin down for 2022 and trying out the piano. We'll return to your course in 2023. Absolutely. Um, lovely to hear that. To help find. We have no 
your all videos help one thing. Yeah, people sometimes ask me that. That there are I, I counted them and <laughs> I didn't count them. I, I looked up this morning how many videos there are on my channel, and there are 599 with the one that I recorded today, 599 videos uh, on my channel. So I can imagine if it's difficult to find things. And can I suggest that if you want to find something specific, you can either uh, find the search bar and write it in there or go onto the tab playlist. You know, on the home page, there's this horizontal line of all sorts of home and about and playlists and so on. Find a playlist, you get a drop down and the videos are all selected by player level. So if it's for beginners or for intermediates or advanced. But they're also organized by genre. So um, Suzuki courses, wagon wheels courses, technique videos, tuning videos, and so on. So if you go on the drop down playlists, it's easier to find. I'm thinking of clever ways to make it all more accessible, but I think this is more or less the best way to do it. But, but the search bar also will help you find things if you want to. Um, dotted rhythms, long, short, and short, long. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ah, another person is saying, uh, sorry, I'm just reading through that um, uh, chat box. 77 Social says, looking in the mirror is also helping with the straight bowing. Definitely good plan as well. My friend who started me on the violin is making a comment. Maybe we're good enough on minuet too, and we can just skip for now. When do you decide a piece isn't for you? Uh, that is That happens to a lot of people, isn't it? And you think, I can still remember from when I learned the violin, and, and you think, I, I've spent quite a lot of time on it now, and I just can't do it. And that is the moment where you get frustrated and you think, I don't like this because I don't know how to do it. That might be the moment just to put it aside and do something else. As violinists, we are lucky because we have a vast repertoire. So there is always something else that you can play if one piece doesn't agree with you. So that is um, lucky. If you played an instrument which has a more limited repertoire, you must sometimes play those pieces, you see. Uh, but uh, we're in luck. Just let it go if it's not good and find something else. Uh, so Kim is saying your videos are fantastic, the, ba the best, really. Thank you so much. That's really, really kind of you. If you want to support this channel, I've said it sometimes uh, before as well, there is a, a button in the channel banner at the top um that says support this channel and you can buy me a coffee that would be wonderful i'm a great coffee drinker i love it what you can also do is uh, find a super sticker show your support from brown strings buying a super sticker or much more simple um is just using paypal and info at proamstrings.com so that is in case you want to buy me a coffee that'd be lovely after this lesson that'll be amazing <coughs> No, definitely, uh, Kim, don't worry about moving on from Minuet 2. Uh, Eniko, thank you. That's a really kind comment. So, Wendy, I have received three tips that I never found anywhere before. Instantly solved my challenge. Uh, this is something that I get all the time. And I am in awe of you guys who are learning with me on YouTube. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that people who would follow video lessons would make so much progress. And occasionally people come to me and have a lesson with me and I'm just flabbergasted at the amount of um, progress that people make by just being willing to learn and, and listening to instructions and following the instructions to the letter. So bravo, everyone. Um, and sometimes people come to me for a one-off lesson and I can help them with just that little thing that stops you from progressing. And that this is why I still do <laughs> this sort of thing, is that I find that really, really rewarding. I can remember uh, some person who I taught a couple of years ago. He'd done really, really well. 
uh, by practicing with my channel. And there was just one moment when he could not progress anymore and he got really frustrated and he booked a lesson with me through my website, proarmstrings.com. And it turned out that there was an issue. I think he'd always played with the shoulder rest upside down. So if I can help you with tiny little things like that, you can then carry on learning yourself. So uh, absolutely respect, deep respect from my side to you guys, how you progress so well by just watching these videos over and over again. Um, <laughs> Ebony says, oh my gosh, we've finally caught you live. <laughs> that is a lovely comment. Really good to see you here. And um, some names I recognize because I every day I read the comments of the videos. And um, I may have come across your name, but then uh, you might be quite new as well. So very, very welcome. Uh, once you've mastered straight bowing, what do you think you should learn and practice? Um, Rihanna, that very much depends on what you want to learn. Now, there are lots of different books on my channel that I use for teaching the violin. And that was especially over lockdown, I've been recording just to help my local pupils that come for lessons to me, um, to help them get through the week and give them a little bit more support. So this is why when I started recording all these student books. Um, but then on YouTube, there are people who either haven't got access to books. I mean, uh, in Africa, for instance, people just have to drive for three hours to find any other shop or in Australia as well. I've come across people who were just just too far away from a shop. Um, and I've started doing some courses like the virtual practice play along course that you can do without a book. So if you want to um, go on to that course and follow that, then you will be taken smoothly organically through the violin technique from where you can then learn a, a lot further again so it's called the virtual violin practice play along if you if you find that course follow it and you can just learn to play without any books now as you may have noticed uh, at the moment the project that i'm doing is mindfulness for violin playing because the reason why I did that is why I started making that course is that a lot of people give me the impression that they get scared to make a mistake. So they learn their pieces and then they think, oh, I can never get past bar 16 or so because it's so difficult. And people get really, really uptight and worried about it, which then in turn makes it harder to get past that bar. So the mindfulness course helps you to enjoy playing the violin without the stress of making mistakes and I think for a lot of people out there who find it quite challenging to play the violin rightly so because that's what it is hopefully it will just help you relax and make playing a little bit easier so go on that course as well if you fancy <clears throat> Enika says Henry has crick bone course and the crick bone course is a very old fashioned method and I love it. And that is the method that I started playing from. My teacher told me to get this book or maybe we had it in the house. I don't know because my mother and my granddad used to play the violin. That's how I got into violin playing because we had this violin in our loft. And I thought it was hugely interesting to do something that nobody in my class or in my school did. And this is how I started to play violin. So maybe we had the crick bow method somewhere in a pile of books. I don't know. But it's a very, very good method. And I know, Enika, you love it, don't you? Um, Linda says, thanks for what you do, Henriette. Your videos are always so easy to understand as you explain everything so clearly, definitely. the best. <laughs> That's really nice. You make me very shy now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. From the Philippines, says Jess. Welcome, Jess. Lovely to see you here. And here we've got comments from Mozart's Rosin. Hello. I have a question about improving double stops. I've started learning the third piece from Suzuki Boot for the, Z the Zeitz Concerto 5, th third movement, and any help will be appreciated. Now, I haven't got it in my head right here, um, but... Perhaps you can put another comment down and tell me exactly what you find 
difficult about the double stops? Is it the left hand or is it a bow or is it just a combination of the two? Uh, Kim also says, yes, great boom. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, very much appreciated. Lovely to have your questions here, Rihanna. Uh, thanks for asking. So while we're waiting for Mozart's Rosin to uh, think about what makes the double stops challenging in the Zeit Concerto, um, let me just um, find another question that someone's written below a video. Pinky too, sh Pinky too Short is one question. Now, unfortunately, this person didn't say whether they were talking about their left hand pinky or the bow pinky. And both things can happen. So people ask me this sometimes and say, I can't reach my pinky. You see here, it doesn't go towards the string. That's quite a common issue. So if that's you, if you find that difficult, don't worry about it. Again, this is a little hint that I'm going to give you and you will be able to do it better. And this has something to do with your left elbow. Look, I'm swinging my elbow underneath my violin. And what it does, if I bring my elbow under the violin this way, my pinky, can you see, it steers towards the left. So it, what's the matter is your pinky isn't too short but it's your elbow that might be that way, you see? So bring your elbow round underneath the violin, maybe even as far as bringing it out so that it sticks out this side, and you'll steer your finger, your pinky in particular, your fourth finger, towards the string. Something else that might be happening is when your wrist is like this. Again, when my wrist is like that, my, my fingers are away from the strings. Now, look what happens to my fingertips if I alter my wrist. See the difference? So if my wrist is here and you've got this bend in your wrist, your fingers are not where they need to be. I need my fingertips on the strings, don't I? So what you need to do is alter your wrist that way. So if you find your pinky too short, there's two things that you can do. Bring your elbow under and make sure that your wrist is pushed out because if your wrist is pushed out, there is this hinge, isn't there? And then your fingertips will come towards the string. Hopefully that helps. Now, if that person meant the pinky is too short on the bow, that also sometimes happens, doesn't it? And it falls off here. Now, what you can do then, you're just pouring your cup of tea a little bit too far that way. And what you want to do is you want to, what's called in fashionable language, supinate your hand a little bit. You've gone too far this way and you want to even it out that way. Okay. And that way, look, if I'm leaning too far towards my index finger, I pronate too much. My pinky is loose and I can't use it. Whereas if I, again, lower my elbow, I guess, and supinate my hand a little bit more in other words tilted the other way that way then my pinky can reach the bow now that's not so easy to do when you're bowing because there's lots going on here isn't it eventually when you you've played the violin for a bit your fingers will become stronger and more flexible and you can move your fingers but initially when you first start to learn that is impossible to do and if that's you not being able to reach See if you can lean towards the right a bit more. Right. <clears throat> I'm going back to my chat box now. Again, if you feel like uh, buying me coffee, by all means, that would be lovely. I love cappuccinos. So um, go on to PayPal and use info at brownstrings.com. Thank you very much. Ebony says... I'm so happy you've decided to teach on YouTube. I have many things to learn that I've never had the opportunity to as a kid. I came to just personally thank you. You're very motivating and kind. Oh, that is really lovely of you to say thank you so much. Motors Rosin, this is the person about the um, chords in the Zeit Concerto. I'm having trouble making the strings sound together, if that makes sense. Yes, they sound unsteady. And sometimes I think I play too loud and I'm a scratching sounds. Okay, now, <clears throat> when you play chords, and this is what it's about, isn't it, playing chords, um, playing chords on the violin, you cannot really play more than two strings together. 
I'll, I'll say that as a, as a starting point. That's not entirely th true because you can occasionally play three strings together. But in everyday life, we tend to play no more than two notes together, two strings together. And that is because of the angle of the bridge. And you can see you can have two strings, but when you play three strings together, you have to tilt it like that. So in this case, this is your bow and it has to tilt. So if you play four part chords, which sometimes happens, uh, you play two notes and two notes and you play them in quick succession. And now I'm going to do what I didn't want to do and I'll show you. Uh, let me just take this scarf off. It's freezing cold in the UK. And I've had the heating off all day. And I was shivering just before this class. So I <laughs> put the heating on and put the scarf on. So um, when we play chords, and I'm playing a four-part chord like this, like that, can you hear that I'm playing two notes and two notes? Bottom note, and I'm going to top two. Now, while I play the top two notes, the bottom two notes will still be ringing, won't they? Because your sound will carry on a bit more. So it sounds as if you play four notes together. And I say as if, really, you are playing four notes together. Except you hit them two and two with the bow. So this might be one thing. I think that is, um, I'm having trouble making the strings sound together. So don't try play them together. Play them two and two. That's your first thing. Then, when you play chords, it's even more important than when you play single notes that your bow is straight. If I want to play a chord and my bow looks like this, it's going to be very, very difficult. And it, it doesn't really sound at all, does it? Okay. So when you play a chord, you want to go extra straight and really push your bow arm forward. And I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I want to hear how you get on with that, first of all. Um, and I think those are the two most common things that can happen when you play chords and things are not quite the way you want it. The sound on silly and sometimes I play too loud. I don't think you play too loud because chords usually are naturally loud. And that is because you simply play four sounds. So it's four times as loud as when you play a single note, you see. Um, you don't mention that you have difficulty with the left hand. So I assume that that is not the issue. It's the sound quality, the, the scratchiness and play how you play the chords together. Barry Duddy, hello there. Nice to see you here. Can I recommend a shoulder rest for a long neck? Yes, um, I used to have a very big shoulder rest and it's called, um, what is it called? Ah, oh, I've forgotten now. It's one with a hook over the shoulder, music core or something like that. That is one thing. Uh, but there have been times in my playing career as well, because I've got quite a long neck, you see, or rather, I've got no shoulders. <laughs> Go straight down here. Uh, and um, when I have extensions made for my shoulder rest, look, at the moment, at the moment, I play with um, a wolf shoulder rest, and it's quite low, quite low set. Can you see that? Now, this you can, of course, unscrew. Of course, now very stiff to do this. Um, you can actually extend it like that as well. And it becomes taller and taller, doesn't it? But what you can also do is to see if you can get to an ironmonger's and see if this bit here they have in a longer version. So you want to the same diameter, uh, but maybe twice as long. And uh, I used to have two of these actually in between both uh, on both legs and they usually I, I have seen them again in the past um, you can have them in metal okay so just go to an ironmonger shop and have this or have it made have this and then much longer and then you can have it a lot higher people do have little uh, because the, the wolf shoulder rest comes with a little spare bag of 
stuff sections that you can put in here but that's more to reinforce this this thin bit here um so yes i'd go for for, for a longer version of that now for beginners i happen to know barry duddy and uh, this person is not a beginner um so but beginners please 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 always twist this down so that you play with a fairly low shoulder rest okay better for beginners than for advanced people all right let me have a look i hope that answers your question uh oh that was one of the three tips okay grow my pinky fingernail on the bowing arm yes that is another one you you have remembered that well this was a previous live class where wendy was talking about pinky falling off the bow um and a little trick of the trade i told her then and she loves this clearly is to grow your fingernail just a little bit longer so that it holds on to that little ridge and that only works if you've got an uh, a bow with edges here you see it doesn't work on round bows but if you have a bow with which is octagonal or something just grow your fingernail a little bit longer on your pinky and it can just hook there um let me see what else until your pinky is stronger and trained good one winter that's a new name that i've never seen welcome to this channel lovely to see you here thank you so much for your lessons i have a problem that my bow is bouncy when trying to play legato very very good question and i'm glad that you address this in this class because that is a very common issue most people when they learn to play the violin at some point come across this and have that really uncomfortable feeling of a bouncy bow now first of all a bow is made to bounce and you can tell from the shape because it is um concave isn't it like that and it's it needs to bounce because when you get more advanced we need to have that bow jump off the strings so we can't do anything about that that's how bows are made and that's how we need the bow to work but if you have a lot of tension especially in your upper arm that tension might just reflect into the bow and it will start to shake it usually happens about sort of here from the middle to halfway along the upper half and that's where the bow is the most bouncy and where it sometimes gets out of control so the cause of this bouncing is tension in your upper arm the solution to this issue is to bow up until where you feel because you can feel it can't you, you think, oh here we go again it's starting then stop the bow stop bowing so you were bowing really nicely stop the bow drop your shoulder and feel the weight of the arm hanging into the string like that and then continue your bow stroke now that doesn't work overnight i could do this five times today and tomorrow i'll be shaking again um, but when you practice that on a daily basis every time when you shake just stop for a split second release the tension in your upper arm and then play in three months time you might suddenly realize oh I haven't shaken at all today you see so this is how techniques sometimes work on the violin you practice and practice and practice and suddenly you get it and it doesn't go come overnight so please 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 be patient that's one of the good things i think that playing the violin teaches us is that there is no instant gratification unfortunately um, but when you keep at it and keep practicing keep relaxing that bow arm before you then continue to bow one day it will be there i hope that helps um delta for one two one two what advice or tips would you tell your younger self who's starting out learning the violin as a beginner oh well <laughs> I'm quiet for a little while. Um, my younger self, so this is for a young person, um, what I would recommend, the most, most, most important thing is not to buy the cheapest instrument that you come across. I, I come across quite a few people who write comments below the videos on my YouTube channel um, that... Um, 
they say, oh, I can't press the strings down and I my violin does not make a sound. Uh, and then it turns out they've bought the cheapest instrument they could find on Amazon and it's just a crap violin. Sorry, excuse the word, but you cannot play on some violins. They just don't work. They are ornamental things or toys or something. So please buy an, as expensive an instrument as you can afford. And that is always going to pay off because, one, you will progress much faster. B, you two, you can enjoy the sound much more. Everything that you buy is reflecting its value. So um, your slightly more expensive instruments will be easier to play and will have a better sound. And if you're very lucky and you invest a little bit more and you're then ready to upgrade, some violins hold their value. So you get the money back when you trade it in for another instrument, you see. So it, it's it's bad on all counts if you go for the absolute cheapest one. Um, if you want to learn to drive a car, you don't drive an old banger. That is not in good working order, do you? So you find a decent car that has a good clutch that you can feel. It's exactly the same when you learn to play the violin. So that would be my number one thing. If I could recommend one thing is that um, do not buy the cheapest instrument. Let me see where we've got to. Um, could you tell your longer self was starting out learning to play the violin as a beginner? That was your question, wasn't it? <clears throat> uh, also, I practice absolutely every day. Now, when I was young, I had the absolute urge to play the violin by nature. There's nothing I could do about it. I just had to do it. Uh, but that means that you then progress really, really fast. And I come across quite a few pupils in my day-to-day -day teaching practice who think they could be actually really good if they didn't actually do 25 different clubs, football and tennis and violin and piano and saxophone and singing lessons and ballet classes and drama. And you think home in on one or two or three things, but not the complete range. That would be uh, my advice as well. So, my violin neck rests slightly on the pad of my palm, right at the bottom of the index finger. Seems it's just started watching. Looks neck is supported only by thumb, always. <clears throat> Good question, Kim. Uh, yes, <laughs> there is there is quite a diff difference between uh, world class performers and you and I playing the violin. So we cannot really think because. Um, Augustine does it like that. I need to do it like that. Um, I think it's quite good to rest your index finger on that pad uh, because it's simply impossible to play like that and have your fingers in the right place. So I think this is a good habit. What's developed is good. So you might rest it right there. So long as you're not squeezing. And when you're squeezing, obviously you can't change position and so on and you, your fingers get stiffer. So, so long as only resting is absolutely fine. Now, holding the violin is a balance. Sometimes I hold the violin mostly with my neck, and other times I hold the violin mostly with my hand. And it's that balance that makes neither my neck sore or my left hand, you see. So it's that balance that you want to develop by doing an exercise like this, you might also look at my mindfulness course in the last three lessons, 19, 20, 21, maybe, <laughs> I'm guessing now. Uh, there are exercises there for help you strengthen your neck and to find that balance. So you might have a look there as well. That brings me to another question that I suddenly remember. Someone who says, what can I do? My left thumb is stiff and sore. So when your left thumb is stiff and sore, there might be different um, issues going on. First of all, you might be squeezing. I don't know who this is. It might be one of you guys. It might be something, somebody completely different. That means that your thumb is squeezing. So you might want to do exercises to let go of your thumb. And, and look now, I'm supporting my violin with that pad that you just mentioned, Kim. Okay, so... You might come across an open string in your music occasionally and you might do this. 
okay? It might also be that this thumb is way too far underneath and it's stiff and sore because it's it's leaning onto your thumb. So in that case, make sure that your thumb is just peeking over the edge like that, okay? And it may also be that your thumb is stiff and sore because you're squeezing it here and it goes over. And again, you want to see your thumb goes just peeking over the edge. And I'm hoping that answers your question and the question of the person who wrote that below a video. Now, another question that someone's written underneath a video, which is a good one, that goes slightly with this same aspect. Um, should all, uh, no, sorry, that's a different one. How much pressure to apply on the left hand fingers? I think that comes nicely with uh, the issues of the left hand, doesn't it? Now, the left hand fingers, if they press the string down, they, they stop the string and press the string against the fingerboard. Um, and that is as much pressure as you need to apply. So just to stop the string. If you press any harder, you're only going to hurt your fingertip and it's not altering the sound at all because squeezing that string harder against the fingerboard will not make your sound any different. It's slightly different when you play double stops, in which case you might want to squeeze a little bit harder, but not much. So you, I see sometimes people come and they've got a lot of force onto their fingertips. Try softening it up a little bit. Pretend your fingerboard is really hot and you'll burn your fingers when you play, when you squeeze those strings down. And gradually, again, it doesn't come overnight, but over time, you'll find that that will start to relax a little bit more. That then brings me to another question that somebody's asked. How much pressure should all right hand fingers always be relaxed? Uh, so we're talking about the left hand and now we're talking about the bow hand. Should they always be relaxed? And the answer is no, not always, because sometimes the right hand fingers need to steer the bow. And that is the function of the right hand fingers is to steer the bow. First of all, I could steer the bow up and down. Can you see that? So if my pinky is pushing the bow down so the point goes up, it's definitely not relaxed, it's pressing. If I squeeze my index finger so the point of the bow goes down, I'm relaxing my pinky, but I'm pressing down there. And I'm certainly not relaxing my thumb if my bow is pivoting on the thumb, you see. So the answer to that question, should the right hand fingers always be relaxed, is no. Now, not only can I squeeze it up and down, but I could also squeeze it forwards and backwards, you see. Or I might roll the bow between my fingers, you see. So there is a lot that the right hand fingers can do. And this is the reason why we've got such a complicated bow hold. Now, let me just read through one or two more questions and then we're coming up to the end of this hour. And I'm just in awe of you asking all these relevant questions. Thank you so much. Will you make more Suzuki Method classes? It will be very useful. I've got, I would love to. Tahora Tuhin. Lovely to see your name here. Uh, welcome. I would love to, but I've got a long list of requests. So my first class that I'm going to do after the mindfulness course is finished is all for strings and that's been a sort of long awaited thing by many of you who have requested it um, and then I'll think what I'll do afterwards I don't know. Morad Vadi, hello and welcome thank you for your starting to play violin thanks for your videos. Mozart's Rosin says, yes, thank you. I think I found out a problem. It's keeping my bow straight. I've just been studying playing double stops and chords and I will work on it. Thanks again. Uh, that is really good. Yeah, straight bowing. Uh, keep an eye on the mindfulness course because very shortly there will be um, a lesson on playing chords. There we are. Uh, Delta Foot, is there a certain exercise to help getting a good tone with smooth, consistent bowing? Um, I'm also going to refer you to the mindfulness course uh, and in two or three lessons there will be a lesson on that so I'd much rather take you through step by step through the whole process than, than quickly explain it to you here so mindfulness of violin playing mindfulness for violin players course 
in the next few lessons. It will be released either this week or next week. I think that's going to be a view to me. Ah, oh, okay. Um, this is a very good question. Thank you, Kim, for asking that question. At what point should one start to memorize pieces like reading? A reading is a, a composer and he's written lots of violin concertos. Now, I think that there is a lot of merit in um, memorizing a piece almost from the beginning. Uh, little pieces, short pieces, because training your memory is such a useful thing for violin playing. Uh, with my regular violin students like children that are learning, I always have one memorization piece on the list. So once a piece is finished, I always tell my pupils, um, uh, I always tell my pupils, learn it off by heart now, because you internalize it so, so much better when you memorize it. So uh, I would recommend always to have one memorizing piece on the go. Now then, final, final question. Um, isn't the mindfulness series amazing? Mindfulness is excellent. <laughs> That's really good. Yes, yes, yes. Please play for us violin solo. Uh, <laughs> okay. So training the mind is useful. Yes. Training the mind is super useful for everyone. So you guys, why not learn your current piece off by heart? And that is the positive note that I would like to, to finish on. Thank you all so much for watching and for watching my YouTube channel. So much, much appreciated. Look out for uh, the next live class. I don't know when it will be, but six to eight weeks, I guess, but it will be announced in the YouTube channel. So once more, if you want to buy me coffee, that is much, much appreciated. Go on PayPal, info at brahamstrings.com, but you can also click the link to any coffees underneath each of the videos. Lovely to see you here today. And I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Ha, ha, ha.